So, hi, I'm Jay. Uh, you might notice I have an American accent. Uh, I came here a month ago for this meetup and React Advanced. Uh, but I like London a lot. Oh, right, the microphone. I like London a lot, so I thought I'd stick around for some extra rain. So, uh, this is actually my first talk. So, uh, wish me luck on this. Woo! Woo! So I make Legend, which is a productivity app that combines documents, to-do list, email, calendar, all in one. Uh, some people have documents that get up to 100,000 items. It can display multiple at the same time. It can get really intense. There's a lot of optimization in there. Uh, I'm also working on Bravely, which is a platform for therapists to run their practice and collaborate more closely with their clients. Uh, these are both very different, but they have a lot in common. They should have minimal load times, perfect sync, no jank. So to get Bravely off the ground faster, I just reused a lot of legend. I used the state system I had, the sync system I had. And as I was doing that, a friend suggested that I benchmark it, and it was fine. And that made me very mad. Uh, I used to be a game developer. I worked on games for Xbox 360 and Wii, and the constraints of consoles are super intense. Uh, then I worked at Microsoft. I worked on some hardware, some computer vision products, uh, Connect, Surface, and Surface. And going low level and optimizing stuff is just really fun for me. So when I saw my state system was just OK, I just blacked out. Um, so for an entire week, I have no idea what I was doing. Uh, I paced around my office a lot. I actually sat at my computer for so long that I hurt my neck and I had to go to a physiotherapist. But I tried 17 different ways of doing state faster. And I finally found one. I ended up with doing wild stuff with proxy. Uh, but I'll come back to that. So for now, here's a little demo. So uh, that's not a demo. <laughs> that's not a demo at all. Oh, man. Uh, hold on. Spaces, right? This will be great. Hold on. OK, OK. Stop hollering. Okay. Alright, alright, good enough. Uh, so, so I have uh, an observable here, and it's connected up to a plugin to connect to a database. So I just have the CRUD functions hooked up to that. Microphone. Thank you. I just have the CRUD, the CRUD functions hooked up, and I'm caching it locally. And so uh, then I have that hooked up to the UI, where I have uh, the name bound to the title, the name bound to the text input, and then I update it whenever I get it back from the server. So what that looks like is I have a text box. I can type in it. It changes the title. Now you'll notice that uh, I have React highlighting turned on. So that highlights every time something renders. Nothing's actually rendering except this input box. Um, and then if I switch to the console, let me just kill my server here. Uh, so I can still use it when it's not running. It stops updating that message. Um, and so then let's just refresh the page. Uh, and we're still good. We still have the same data. Start the server. And it connects and syncs. Everything's fine. Uh, so then, back to legend state. So starting with the basics of how this works. Um, why would anybody make another state library? Uh, it's because state's often the biggest bottleneck for both developer experience and performance. Writing a lot of boilerplate code just sucks. It's a waste of time. Um, and then we have all the common ways of managing state are just inefficient, they cause too many re-renders, and then you end up writing a lot of code to manage all the re-renders, and it's just painful. So legend state is all about observables. So you can think of an observable like a signal, uh, but it has hierarchy. You may be familiar with it from other libraries like Knockout or MobX. Uh, so it could be just a string, it could be a big object, it doesn't matter. Uh, so basically they have get and set functions, and they're infinitely nested, so you can get and set anywhere you want. Uh, so a core concept in legend state is observing context. So in this example, 
we're observing the count. So as I set the count, it just reruns observe. Whenever count changes, we rerun. Uh, so there's a few different kinds of observing context in legend state. There's also computed. So I have an observable that depends on other observables. So when f name changes, full name changes too. Uh, and another commonly used one is when. So this one will wait for the return value to become truthy. When it does, it resolves the promise and disposes itself. Uh, this is all cause and effect. So you change a thing and something happens. We find that code is really easy to understand when everything has a clear cause and effect relationship. And that brings me to React. I've been using React for almost nine years and React Native for five years, and I love it. However, uh, I think some of the core hooks work really well for small components, but once apps get really big, it gets confusing and it gets slow because React centers around rendering. So the render function is at the core of React. So then you end up with a lot of code that's devoted to managing rendering. So in a simple example of a uh, kind of common component, uh, we've got some state, we've got um, a value that's derived from it, we have a use effect with a dependency array, and then we have some callbacks. So what happens here is when you change a text, you get a callback. That sets the state. So that triggers a re-render. So then you re-render the whole component. And um, then a side effect <coughs> runs. This side effect is not super expensive. If it was more expensive, you might want to use memo. Maybe you don't. It's debatable. Uh, then the use effect depends on full name. So you need to make sure that you have that in the dependencies. If you add more dependencies, you got to make sure that's up to date. Um, then you have the callbacks. I like to wrap everything in use callback. There's a lot of controversy sometimes about the right thing to do. Uh, but I like to do it that way. And then, of course, you actually render the JSX at the end. So in this pretty small component, we had to make a lot of decisions. I've been doing this for nine years. I don't even know if this is correct. Uh, <laughs> and so if we take the observing context component into React, we just take render out of the middle. I don't think I did that. Uh, <laughs> and so we change the cause render relationship to just cause effect. And render is one of the effects. So if we start with that example, we take the state and we just change that to use observables. And then the dependent state becomes a computed, which is based on first name and last name. So whenever any of those change, the computer just reruns. Um, the use effect becomes the use observe. Whenever full name changes, it'll run itself again. It has nothing to do with rendering, so it just runs itself when it needs to. Um, then the text inputs, we have special components that can just two-way bind to observables. So then we don't uh, have to re-render the outer component because the sub-state changed. So this does not need to render either. And then we don't need the callbacks anymore, so those are just gone. Uh, so now this component only renders once. Uh, and that brings me to performance. So now that we've separated side effects and rendering, we can target renders to be very specific. Uh, because when something triggers an effect, it's not directly tied to rendering. So uh, in this example, we have some global state. You could also just pass it down through props or context. It doesn't matter. Uh, but it's consumed and rendered only when it's needed. So again, with the highlighting, as I type in the input box, it re-renders the little button at the top. The whole app doesn't need to re-render. It's just targeted at where it needs to be. Uh, but we also have a little thing called memo, where we can just give it an observable or a selector function, and it ties that specific text element directly to the input. So you can see that the input's highlighting, but the button is not, because there's nothing actually rendering there. It's just the text is updating itself. Uh, so again. This only renders once. Everything just renders itself when it needs to. Um, we also have some conditional rendering components, like switch and show, because this large outer component shouldn't have to re-render when you show a modal or you change a page. So it just contains all of the re-rendering inside of it. Um, we can also make reactive props. So we have a class name prop, where it takes a function. Whenever the return value of that function changes, the component re-renders itself. So again, this only renders one time. Uh, a feature that Mo inspired last month is the pause provider. Uh, because if you're in React Native, you have all these different screens and tabs and modals and stuff. 
There's no point in rendering things that you can't even see. And so when uh, React Navigation tells you something's out of focus, just stop rendering it. And then when it comes back in, resume rendering. Um, and so because Legend is all about real big documents, I went really deep on array performance. So we have this for component that has a little optimized prop. So what that does is it makes the elements just reuse themselves. So when I swap elements one and two, there, there's no need to re-render the whole array. Just one and two re-render themselves. If I change the text on a single one, just that one re-renders. Because you don't need to re-render the whole outer thing. Um, so because of that and a lot of other optimizations, uh, legend state is just way faster than every other way of using React. Um, and that this doesn't actually measure the minimizing the render stuff at all. This is mostly about mounting time and array performance. Um, so it's fast because it does wild stuff with proxy. And that brings me back to proxy. Proxy is really cool. Normally, what you would do with proxy is you would wrap an object in a proxy to alter or track its behavior. But legend state does it differently. So basically, an observable is like a graph. Every node in the graph has a name, and it has a parent, and it has children. But it doesn't know anything about the object itself. So um, if I access the name on that, for example, what it does is it sees that I'm at the name. It walks the tree up to the root to determine the path that it's at, and then walks back down the object at the path. So this name observable can figure out its own name, basically. Um, so uh, when you set it, we don't have to deal with any immutability or any things that are bad perform performance like that. It just sets the value directly onto the object. Um, and then it propagates the changes up the tree and down the tree. So in this example, we've set the profile. Uh, so previously before, it was location London. It's still London. London didn't change. So we don't need to notify that one at all. So only the name actually changed here. Um, so another interesting thing about this approach is because we don't care about the object itself, we can get deep into this observable before that data actually exists. So we can get the name of this user before it's there. And then once it's there, it'll rerun with the data. So you could say render a component. It'll just be empty. And then once it gets set, we have it. Um, another interesting thing is an observable doesn't actually have to be data at all. So it could just link to other observables to make it computed. Um, it could just link directly to one to kind of proxy through it. Uh, they could be within the same store, within a different store. It doesn't matter. Uh, or it could have an asynchronous value. So you could make an observable that comes from a promise. Uh, it could pull from a file. It could pull from a remote server. And it doesn't actually do anything until you call get on it to activate it. Uh, and so that brings me to sync. So we can augment sync with uh, more power. So we have a new concept that we're calling activated. Now, this all works, but it's still in testing. I'm still building it out. But it's really cool, so I want to show it to you. Um, so in addition to getting, we also have on set. So this basically two-way binds an observable to a remote server. So in this example, we fetch from a URL to fill it out. Whenever we modify it, we send it back to the URL. Um, and then it gives us some extra data so we can wait for it to be loaded. And then once we set it, back to the server. Um, so this lets us basically make the state system <coughs> sync itself. Uh, so I'll go through a little example to show you how to build something like this. So um, to use a real backend, I'm using a backend called Keel, which is actually a new company based in London. And we're migrating bravely to it right now. So I'm very familiar with it now. Uh, and it works really well with legend state because it generates a strongly typed function for every database action. So we can just bind straight to the queries, and it just types everything. Uh, so starting out, we get the user from the database. And then we can add the onset. So whenever I change the user, it just saves it back to the database. Uh, then we can add a subscribe. So we could set up a real-time subscription. So we could, for example, use a pusher channel. Whenever the user gets updated from real time, then we can either use the refresh function to just trigger the get call to run again, or we can update it directly. Depends on how your real-time setup. Um, 
And then we can cache it locally. So we just say we want it in async storage with a key. And so then anytime anything changes locally or remotely, we cache it. And so now that we have a cache, we can start tracking uh, some metadata. So with a timestamp of the last sync, we can then sync only the diffs. And so when we're syncing only diffs, this cuts bandwidth usage significantly, because if nothing changed, we don't download anything. Uh, and then we can add a retry. So that'll make it retry gets and sets indefinitely with an exponential back off. Uh, so if a user has bad signal, it goes offline, everything will continue to work. When they come back, it'll reconnect and sync itself. And then finally, we can add offline behavior. Um, so this does a whole bunch of stuff under the hood. But basically, it caches all of the pending changes. And then when you restart the app, it just continues to retry them until they make it. So you never have to lose data. Uh, but all this is a bit verbose to set up for everything. So we build this into a little plugin. So I made a little Keel plugin. So basically, you just give it the CRUD functions, and the plugin manages everything. So this fully types the user observable, uh, and this observable just syncs itself. Uh, but this example is kind of contrived, because you wouldn't just get a user. That doesn't make sense. You'd actually want to get a user by ID. So the, another feature is lookup table. So we can just say, uh, create a lookup table by user ID, and then with a Keel plugin on that. So then if I. Uh, get a user by name, then it just goes through the lookup table, syncs out to that ID. Uh, and again, get all the loading data on that. When I set that user, it goes back to that row in the table. Um, we can also make helper observables. So I can make a me, which then proxies through to the lookup table out to myself. And so then I can just bind me.name to something and then by accessing dot name, it activates this observable, which then goes and syncs it. And so then as soon as it syncs, it renders itself. Uh, but because we set up the caching, it only do that the first time. The next time you open this, it's already there because it's cached. Um, so here's a little snippet you're not meant to read of Bravely's actual global state system. So we just made a giant store that has everything in it, and the whole thing just syn syncs itself. Uh, and it's very time consuming to build a sync system. I know because it took me a year to build test and beta test all of this in Legend. Uh, so hopefully with all this being open source, it can help you making local first apps without having to reinvent the wheel every time. And we can hopefully avoid screens like this where apps just don't work because you're offline. Uh, when apps are local first, uh, changes that are made while offline will sync eventually. And you can fully work offline. When you restart in your offline, you have all the data already. There's no load times. Uh, mobile apps usually handle this pretty well, but most web and desktop apps just do that. Uh, so they don't work well offline at all, but they could, which brings me to, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's enough. So um, the, the three pillars of Legend State basically are easy, fast, and sync. And I open sourced it because nobody should have to do all that. Uh, building all that sync stuff is just terrible. And I want to see all the apps get better and faster. So I hope Legend of State can help your apps be the very best, like no one ever was. Um, and so, yeah, check it out on GitHub. Uh, I made this cool little QR code you can link to. Uh, talk to me. I'm Jay Meisterich, or Legend App, or Bravely. Check those out. And if you're looking for a really good database, uh, Keel is fantastic, keel.so. The founders are actually here. If you want to stand up, uh, talk to them. <laughs> talk to them after if you want a good database. Uh, so yeah, that's Legend State.